young guys, you know, buying things, chukters when they buy things, you know, they really throw the money about. You take a young working stiff from the highlands or the islands, you know, who's going in to buy clothes, he'll go right up to the sales girl and he'll say, hello, Ira, give me two of these leather jackets there, I, bl black and brown, that's fine. Six pairs of slacks, please. I, waist 32, that's fine. Never mind the color. Uh, 20 shirts. <laughs> color 16, I think it is, but uh, I'll leave the colors to yourself. Oh, I, and, and give me that sheepskin coat there. Too. Are you for sale yourself, Ira? <laughs> <laughs> They'll buy anything. Now, you contrast this with the attitude and behavior of some of our neighbors from south of the border. Hello. My name's Nigel Barrington Smythe. <laughs> I'm English. Uh, the thing is, I'm going out tonight, and I want to sort of cut a dash, you know. Uh, I want to, on one hand, I want to sort of underline the fact that I've had the incredible good fortune to be born well, English. <laughs> On the other hand, I, I want to sort of make a sartorial statement that I have a great deal of empathy for ethnic minorities like the Scotch. Do you understand? Listen, do you sell socks? <laughs> they think that's anti-English? Who, anti, me anti-English? No, we need the English. What the hell do we need the English for again? Oh, oh yes to make television adverts, that's right. <laughs> There's something about a Bank of Scotland bank card that's absolutely, I think insulting's the word he's looking for, right? You know, when an institution with Scotland in its title employs an English voiceover, I think that's bad crack. I'm getting angry now. <laughs> and I've, got, I've no idea what I'm doing, you know? I've lost the place completely. Now, of course, I know what I'm doing. Talking about television. I would like to see more chukters on television. I'd like, and chukteresses. I would, I would like to see a young married woman from the Outer Hebrides, you know, doing an advert on television for, say, soap powder. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mary Catherine McNeil. I come from Barra. I would like to tell you all a wee story tonight about Dallas washing powder. My husband, Michael, would never clean his backside properly after going to the toilet. <laughs> According to his drawers were always in a hell of a mess. <laughs> I could do nothing with them. And then I discovered drawers. <laughs> no, Michael's drawers are shining white. <laughs> and the washing machine is full of cash. <laughs>
I wish some of my old girlfriends could hear you, Rod. <laughs> Said I'd never be up to any good. But there you are. I wish, uh, the guy I wish I, I wish <laughs> I've had a stroke. That's what's happened. <laughs> I wouldn't matter so much, you know, in the summertime when I'm entertaining Yorkshire people, you know. I could do a Peter Sellers right in front of them. <laughs> they just go up and say, that's it, Mabel, show's over. Let, let's go up and have a cup of tea. <laughs> no, my next-door neighbour in Ben Beck and I was growing up, Colin McPhee, you know, he would have enjoyed that. That's Fatshaw Shane who I got him. He was a Gaelic speaker, you know. Colin some machine, you know. Lived in Green and he's been back, you know. Walking syringe, he was. <laughs> 14 or 15 kids, they weren't sure, one of them bad. <laughs> Never left the island of Ben Bacula. In fact, some people say he didn't leave the house much, but uh, <laughs> one night he came out of Gregory Hotel with the carry out. The council had been working and they left a big hole on the road outside the hotel, caught them with the jochen, torn over tip into the hole, ball up down he went, unconscious. He's lying there all night. My uncle, she was very okay, he's passing. Flashes the torch right and says, Calvin, are you all right, Are you all right, Calvin? Calvin said, Yes, darling, put off the light and shut the door. I could have said that. <laughs> Took him to Inverness to Rigmore Hospital. He's in there for four weeks, the leg in traction. Nobody's going to visit him because he's on the mainland. All his friends are in Ewes. But one guy went to see him. Guy called him Kinyatu Machlachwe. Ian McLaughlin, composer of the Dark Island. You remember that, don't you, Lament? Big hit for Elton John about eight years ago. <laughs> well, he went to see him, and he's no stranger to the juice of the barley himself. <laughs> he said, I want to have him on the Joe Ash. You're in a good place, Colin. You'll be out of here in no time. Colin said, what did you say? He said, I'm saying you'll be out of here in no time, Colin. You're in the right place. What did you say? Oh, God, Colin, you've gone deaf as what a slave. I'm saying you'll be out of here in no time. What's the matter with you? He said, I'll tell you that. He said, I've been stuck in this place for four weeks without a drink. And your breath is like a breeze from heaven. <laughs> he, he took on... He, he sued Inverness County Council for 200,000 pounds. He was taken into court on a stretcher and he testified with his right hand on the Bible that he had been paralyzed from the neck down. And very frequently he had been, too. <laughs> and he won the 200,000 pounds. But the opposition lawyer, a typical lawyer and a typical Invernesian, gave him a pull, you know, and said, Here, look here. Master McPhee, come here. I want to talk to you. He says, Listen, you lied in that courthouse today. You did. You won your 200,000 pounds, but you're not going to spend a penny of it because you're no more paralyzed than I am. Because we want to follow you everywhere you go. And if you as much as move a mess up, we'll have you in court on fraud charges. Carl said, is that so? You listen to me in two minutes' time. An ambulance is going to take me from this court to Del Cross Airport. And an aeroplane is going to take me from Inverness to Glasgow. And then another aeroplane is going to take me from Glasgow to Paris, France. And then yet another ambulance is going to take me from Paris to the shrine at Lourdes, and you're going to see the biggest miracle you ever saw in all your life. He, he, used to, he used to come to Oban every October, he and his wife Bella, how to describe her delicately, she was not dealing with a full deck of 52 cards. Her porch light was out. <laughs> She did not have both oars in the water. <laughs> but the uh, first night he's here, they had a wee flat in the guard street. He's lying drunk in the chair. She came and said, Oh, how in the hunt are you scrawl? She put the half Nelson on him. She walked him around the town of Oban, trying to sober him up, took him up Jacob's ladder, overlooking the town. She propped him up and said, Chief, you hear the shit of how? What is he down there? He's still half smoked. He's not seeing very much. A big, big chimney and a lot of orange lights. And I think smoke is coming out of the chimney. He said, that's the open distillery, Colin. They're making the Scotch whiskey faster than you can drink it. I said, Colin, I've got the buggers working overtime. Huh? <laughs> Another time, he's over in the Clariton Hotel, over at Lamont's place there, and he's sitting, and this young fella, this young stud comes in from Dunbeg. He's wearing the leather gear, and Carlos says, Hey, Toad, listen. He said, What you got inside your jacket there? The young fellow said, Oh, it's, 
Just a wee Labrador puppy I got for the wife. God, I wish I could make a swap like that, says Howard. <laughs> Another time he goes to Quick Fit Euro, comes back, he says, Listen, Barra, you never get what I guess what I bought today. Four new tires with my initials on white paint around the side. CM, Colin McPhee, how about that? <laughs> said, Ah, oh, yes, the heel. How? Are you off your head? What are you buying four tires for? You don't even have a motor car. So what's it, Colin? You buy brassiers? 